about to have church for the third time this morning. God is good. This, you know, a couple of weeks ago I shared that part of walking in the kingdom, we're going to need several things. We, we covered last week the blood of Jesus. How many now understand the blood of Jesus just a little bit better? I'm going to take this up so it doesn't mess with uh, our recording this morning. There's so much to do, sometimes it's hard to remember it all. This week I'm going to deal with the name of Jesus is one of the things that I forgot to bring. I had a lot of things set out to bring. A couple of weeks ago, Sister Diane was at a conference and she brought back a little card that talked about the name Yeshua in Hebrew and that it's actually on the right hand, that our, our fingers and our hand actually make up the name Yeshua. So when Jesus said he was going, when, he, when God would stretch forth his right hand with his salvation, salvation is written in his hand. I thought that I, I forgot it this morning. I'm going to put it on the video. But it also, uh, one of the reasons why we understand that the Luciferian way is called the left handed way, because then it has salvation backwards. And the occult believe that they can undo things by speaking it backwards. How many know there's realization to all these things? And uh, I kind of wanted to deal with that, but God, you know, really wanted me to go in a direction because the, the body of Messiah does not understand the name of Jesus. I remember years ago in the charismatic movement that uh, people began to teach, whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, the Father's got to give it to you. And I literally have seen them get up and do a Jericho march. God's got to give me whatever I ask in the name of Jesus. And really, guys, it was the flesh out. That all of a sudden, it's like, I found this secret formula. I've got the Father God in a headlock, and whatever I ask him in the name of Jesus, he's got to give it to me, because that's what Jesus said. And I understand the Hebraicness of that statement. And how many know that uh, that didn't work out for a lot of people? Didn't work out. And here's one of the reasons why. As I was praying this morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, the modern theology of grace today is forged from the depths of our carnality. Just think about that. Grace means you can get away with anything you want. God's got to accept you. There are a lot of old saints back there, McLaren, McEachern, Strongs, Spurgeon. How many none of them ever believe that? Grace was the power of God not to sin. Grace was being accepted and then transformed into something other that could walk with God. And so a lot of the things that we see going on right now in, in the body of Messiah grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves him. Because we, we claim to be getting more like Jesus every day, but we're getting more like the devil. Because the devil, his theme is me. I. Isn't that what he said when he fell? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. It's all about me, 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 myself, and I. Satan is the ultimate narcissist. And carnality is about self. But let me tell you something. Jesus said, he who holds on to this life, I like the way the Amplified says it, he who holds on to his lower life or his carnal life shall lose the high life, his higher life. But he who lets it go, who lets that be crucified, he shall get the higher life. You see, there's something beyond your flesh. That's all about in the name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Guys, Jesus set the standard regarding his name. Don't you think that's just proper? You know, nobody should set the standard for your name but you. And nobody sets the standard for the name of Jesus except Jesus himself. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing this in the midst of conflict, that there was conflict, that there was turmoil in the church of Philippi. Starting with verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, uh, bowels and mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through vice or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem other better than themselves. Let me tell you something. In most, church, in most churches today where there's strife, it's because there's a flesh out. Carnality and flesh 
causes problems. How many know carnality and flesh will cause problems in a marriage? One of the hardest things with a young couple is to get them to understand that marriage does not revolve around them. It revolves around them. A one-sided marriage will never last. Each one's got to esteem the other above themselves. Many times that's what makes a husband get up and work long hours. Even though his flesh doesn't want to, he wants to take care of his family. And the wife may not want to get up and cook that day and iron that day and take care of the kids that day and all the. Let me tell you something. How many know a woman at home works just as hard, if not harder, than the man at work? Amen. Okay? That's just the truth of it. Why does she do it? She loves her kids and her husbands more than herself, and she sacrifices by what she does. Only when you do that will a marriage ever work. In church, the only way it is ever going to work is we've got to lay down our carnality and start walking by the Spirit. You see, if we're walking by the Spirit and we esteem Christ above all, we're all going to start talking the same thing. Most of the crazy theologies today are based on a carnality and self, about the flesh. The Apostle Paul said, quit that. If there's any consolation in Christ, if you have any love of God in you, quit it. <laughs> Stop it. It's tearing apart the body. But now we have entire movements based upon those very things. But let's, let's look at what, what he goes on to say. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. This is a command. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. This, this one statement, if we will do it, is going to open up the power of God in your life. Well, Mike, how can you say that? Because I have seen a lot of people that were baptized supposedly in the Holy Spirit that never really moved in any power. They were still walking in carnality. They were still walking in strife. They were still walking in the things of the flesh. And the devil got more done through them than God ever did. Why? Because they did not let this mind be in them which was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God thought it was not robbery to be equal with God. Now, none of us can say that. Do you know that? He was God in the flesh. If anybody had any reason to brag and to get puffed up, it was Jesus. He was the only one on the earth that had not messed up. The only one on the earth that was totally right, that could totally hear from the Father, that could totally move in the power of the Holy Spirit, that there was no sin whatsoever in his life, is what the Apostle Paul was. If anybody was absolutely right, it was absolutely Jesus. But look at what he says. But made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of the servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Underline that in your Bible. He humbled himself. He that does not humble himself will not walk in the power. He that does not humble himself cannot walk in the name. He that will not humble himself cannot bear the name of God, and if he's not careful, he will make the name of God vain in the earth. But he humbled himself, and the next phrase, and became obedient. Humility and obedience are the two things that you've got to have in this day and this hour to walk with God. If you don't, do you ever notice, now I'm, I'm old military, the guy who won't humble himself and sticks his head up out of a foxhole, what gets shot? If the, fle if the flesh raises up, now in the past, we, we, we were in an environment where you could have a flesh out and there wasn't necessarily big complications for you, maybe everybody around you, but not necessarily for you. In the day and the hour that we're coming into, if your flesh raises up, the devil will cut it off. It will cost you. If you choose not to get in the flesh, it's going to cost the devil. I am tired of the devil costing me. I want, it, I want it to be costly to him. But to do that, I've got to humble myself and be obedient to the Father. That means when your flesh don't want to. 
When you don't necessarily, the devil whispers in your ear, you have a right to get mad. You have a right to have your say. And he's baiting you. Come on, come, come on into my territory. Come on into my territory. I got you, I got you, I got you. Oh, don't it feel good. Oh, it feels good to, just to have your say and to, and to express what you really feel about this situation. And the whole time heaven weeps. They're, th- they're saying you just walked into enemy's territory. You just left your angels behind. You're, you're going where angels won't go. And then the devil bops you upside the head, and he's, then you say, why did God let this happen to me? He didn't. You did. Remember last week, if you stay under the blood, the devil can't touch you. You just walk up from underneath the blood. The blood will not cover carnality. The kingdom of God is there to crucify carnality. But when it resurrects itself and wants to dance around, the blood is not going to cover it. It's our job to keep it crucified. It says, And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore? Wherefore? Because, and what, what wherefore is, wherefore is like therefore. You stop and see why it's therefore. That there, there's something there that because of this you get this. You know, sometimes it's a hard lesson for kids when they get to the age that you want to start teaching them responsibility so that if you find, and they discover if they don't do the chores, they don't get the prize. How many know that's a valuable lesson? That is a valuable lesson that for this last generation, we're not teaching our kids this anymore, and we do them a disservice because if we think it's like that in the family, they're grows, growing up thinking it's that way in the kingdom. They get this entitlement mentality. You're only entitled to one thing in the kingdom of God. You're entitled to crucify the flesh. Until you do that, nothing else works. Jesus himself, because he did that, he got this. And if this is the way it worked with Jesus, it's going to work that way with everybody else, and there is no exception. Wherefore, God has, has, has all, also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow with things in heaven of things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, how many know that demons have to bow the knee to the name of Jesus? I've been there, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But let me ask you something. If you won't bow to the name, why are they going to bow to the name through you? That's how we have Christians that have tried to stand in authority and got their lunch eat. They're trying to demand the demons to submit to something they won't submit to. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, you're dismantling. No, I'm not. I'm speaking truth this morning. Paul's command, let this mind be in you. That's the mind of Christ. People walk around and giving all these almost psychic interpretations of things, calling it having the mind of Christ. If you don't humble yourself and let that mind be in you, then everything else you're doing is out of his mind. In other words, it's not a part of it. And we have a lot of people that are prophesying out of their own spirit, prophesying out of their own flesh. I've got to start with let this mind be in Mike Lake, which was in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and obeyed. If I get that, everything else begins to fall into place because Jesus set the standard. Submission and humility are the keys to the power of his name. Do you know, you know the reason why the demons begin to automatically respond to the name of Jesus before the crucifixion? Because Jesus is the only one who dwells out of space and time. He is the ultimate singularity in space-time continuum. And therefore, as he was functioning in the earth, in the spirit realm, he he was already the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That's going to kick in here just in a minute. I know that's a little sci-fi for you. But he was already walking in the victory he was about to do in the flesh. He had already done in the spirit. 
they had to bow the name because they knew. They didn't understand why. They just knew there was a force compelling them. There was something outside of time and space that was forcing them to submit to the name even before the cross. Well, how much more after? How much more after? That's why the apostles, even before the day of Pentecost, were casting out demons in Jesus' name, were healing the sick in Jesus' name. Because the cross dwells outside of time. That's why the Bible says there was one day that Abraham got into the spirit. Carl Koch does such a better, better job in the Hebrew in this when he was getting ready to sacrifice Isaac and the Lord said, Abraham, 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 Abraham. In the Hebrew, it's he looked and he saw something. He looked and he saw that day. That's why Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. Abraham understood. Bah. I just can't wait to see what this lamb's going to do. I got a ram today, but I'm getting a lamb one day, and I just can't wait. Why is it that we have believers use the name but get no results, no humility, and no obedience? The name of Jesus will not work in disobedience and in pride. It will not work. Demons will laugh at you because you're on their battlefield. You're unarmed, dancing around in your BVDs, talking about how you're dressed in the armor of God and have the power of the name of Jesus. And nothing you do in the spirit or in the soul or in the flesh remotely reflect his name. See, I want, to, I want, I want every one of you to get to the place. You're so walking in the name that if a demon manifests itself, you start moving in that authority and there's no resistance to the authority moving. Come on. That when you pray in the name of Jesus, there's nothing in your life to hinder the answer to what you're asking for. But you've got to understand humility and submission. In verse 10 it says things, and, and it's italicized, that everything... This, this was not the intent of the original language, and the translators literally put it there to, to, to try to make sense. Guys, we need to realize that everything in heaven, everything in earth, and everything in the underworld or under the earth will bow to the name of Jesus, i.e., when the name of Jesus is being enforced by the will of God. Only when we live our lives the way that Jesus lived it is the power of the name released. And let me tell you something, heaven is longing to release the majesty and the power of his name through his people. I mean, I, I can hear heaven groaning over this. It's like I long, if you know what's coming, I long to be able to raise up. The name of the Lord is a strong and high tower. How's that name going to be raised up? In a people that are living it. You can become a part of that tower. That as the enemy comes in like a flood, we become the standard that the Lord raises up. There's a transition from the Lord always rescuing you out of trouble to getting to the place that you become the thing God raises up to stay, in the, hand of the, to stay the hand of the enemy. That's what I'm talking about. Anytime a believer has ever laid hands on somebody and they were healed, God used them to raise up a standard that pushed back the enemy out of that person's life. We're so far removed from understanding that name and what it means. We're not representing his name anymore. It's time to return back to humility and obedience to God. We need to understand about walking in the name of Jesus. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Verses 15 through 17. Let the peace or the shalom of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now here we're going to see another clue here. 
Dwell in, uh, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That sounds familiar. Doesn't it? That sounds... Paul is echoing something. He's repeating something. He's repeating a concept. Didn't Jesus tell us in John 8, 31 and 32, then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my, my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That word continue in the Greek is mino, which means to remain, to abide, to dwell. If this word abides in you. Isn't that what Jesus was saying? If my words abide in you. That means they take up residency. They, the word of God is not supposed to come and visit you. The word of God is supposed to come and dwell in you. The word of God is supposed to come and take your heart. The word of God is supposed to fill you and be the rule of law in your life. The governing of your life. Jesus said, if you are my disciples. If you're going to discipline your life, church, we're called to live a disciplined life. Boy, isn't that unpopular? Discipline, commitment, dedication are almost four-letter words right now in the body of Christ. But they're the standard of Messiah. They're the standard. Now, how many know the Jews that were there understood discipleship? They understood discipline. They daily disciplined themselves by Moses if they were really walking with God. And, and, and Jesus is reinforcing that. Let the way that I have taught you Torah, let the way that I have taught you how to walk with God abide in you. And if you let it absolutely make its residence to be, to be ever present with you, it's going to do something in you. It's going to do something in you. I'm always amazed that, you know, we have services like we have today. Uh, I've seen people leave and say, boy, Jimmy really needed to be here today. How many know Jimmy isn't here because the Holy Spirit didn't bring Jimmy here? You're here because you needed it. You needed to hear it. And if you will let this word abide in you, it'll set you free. Let Jimmy take care of the things of Jimmy. God wants to get his word deep in you because you've got an area of your life that the Holy Spirit is wanting to set free. Let that word dwell in you. That know, you shall know the truth is experiential. It's not theoretical. I remember one time when I was in the military, I led a Lutheran chaplain to the Lord because he asked me, is, is the born-again experience, is it theoretical or is it experiential? And I began to explain to him what Jesus had done in my life, what little bit was I allowed him to do back then. How many know that the Lord has done so much more from over 30 years ago? But I began to explain to him how Jesus is real and that salvation is real. There's a real experience with it. It's transformational. And I remember, I, I was scared. I mean, I, I was, I was a, a spec four in the Army. That's a corporal in the Army. And I'm talking to a major. How many know that, 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 that that's kind of shaky ground? And I knew that I was making an impact when his lips began to quiver. And tears begin to roll down his face. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, e either I'm going to get court-martialed or, or we're going to have revival. Is this one or the other? Because you, you, you learn in the military, if somebody outranks you, you better show respect, otherwise there are absolute consequences. And I remember as his lips began to quiver and he began to cry, he said, I always hoped it was so. I always hoped it was so. Let me tell you something, there are those here today and those that are going to listen to this on video, there are things of God that in your heart you've always said, oh, I hope it was so. 
I hope it was so. Let me tell you something. If I approach the walk with God as Jesus did in humility and in meekness and in obedience and start letting that word dwell in me, you're going to go from hope so to know so. I know so. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 11. How I many know oh, little babies don't bother me? If sometimes, if you could hear from the way that I hear, I've heard that come out of your spirit quite a lot here in this church. I get to preaching real hard, and instead of hearing, that's right, I hear, ah, ah. <laughs> I don't want to hear that, Mike. Tough. Truth is truth. Wherefore also... For starting verse 11, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him also to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he was basically saying is you carry the name. You carry the name. When we, when we look at this, look, he said, I, I want you to be count worthy of the calling, to begin walking worthy of the name, walk worthy of what God has called you to do. That means to walk in humility and to walk in obedience to God. And the good pleasure of his will. That word pleasure there is eudokia in the Greek, which means the will, the choice, the good will, the good attempt, the benevolence, the pleasure, the satisfaction, or for pleasure in any absent thing easily produced longing for. God is saying, I long to have my will done in your life, but the only way that I can get my will done in your life is you got to be willing and obedient. you got, you got to be humble and obedient so that I can do that but he said, uh, one of the things that really jumped out, and this is one of the things I'm after, the work of faith with power. The work of faith. The work of being faithful to him. Our faithfulness, God wants to twin it with power. That word power in the Greek is dunamis. Miracle working power. Look what he was praying. He says, now guys, I'm always praying for you that God would see that you're walking worthy of the name. Because that's our calling to walk in that name. That's our calling. All other callings are subservient to walking in the name. I don't care if I'm called to be apostolic. That is, that is subservient to me walking in the name of Jesus. If I'm not walking worthy of that name, I can't function as anything in the body. Now, I may be able to and, and gain titles and, and recognition in the flesh and build all these things out of the flesh. And there's a lot of things today that are being done that we have men calling themselves bishops and apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that all have built it out of the flesh because they have never realized that that calling is subservient to carrying the name of Jesus in the earth. See, well, Mike, why is that important? How many of us have seen churches cover up a sin to protect the name of the church? The name of Jesus has been lowered down here somewhere, and the name of that church or the name of that organization has been lifted up. You see, you'll, you'll work to protect whatever, you're, whatever name you're carrying, and if you're carrying the name of Jesus, you'll work not to sin. There won't be anything to cover up if you're cognizant of your first commission, carry the name. But he says, listen, God, when, when, when I read this, fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, I think of the scripture in the Old Testament that said, my thoughts towards you are good. They're not, they're not evil. God wants you to walk in things that you've never dreamed of. There's giftings within you. There's things that heaven has in store for you that if you learn to function in the name of Jesus, it'll open up everything to you. But you know, many of us will go to the grave never experiencing all of them 
because we've never unlocked them with our obedience. I'm tired of the treasures of heaven being stuck in heaven. I want them to be released in your lives. Now, some of us are seeing that in, in some areas. We have folks here and, and uh, folks that are, that are absent this morning that are part of this congregation that we have seen in the last two or three months got almost double their salaries. How many know that's, that's one side of the coin? But how many know to have joy unspeakable and full of glory is another? There's a joy you can get that goes beyond the paycheck. There's a joy you can get that goes beyond a new car. There's a joy you get that is so deep on the inside of you, it's contagious, and other people will begin desiring the joy that you have. That's what God's after. And it's God's good pleasure. But only when we do that, look, he said that, he said, now, if you, if you begin doing this, that, that you begin walking worthy of it, God has begun fulfilling his goodness, and you're starting to walk in the dunamis of God, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. Is God glorified by a fleshly defeated church? God is glorified by a victorious church that will crucify the flesh and move in the Spirit of God. And when I move in the Spirit of God, it gives glory to His name. And people may not agree with me, but they have got to recognize God. They have got to recognize there's something about them that cannot be pushed down, that cannot be squashed. You know, in the early church in the book of Acts, the harder they were persecuted, the more they grew. That's the church God's after. You can't keep them down. I think that may have been the devil's first experience is what he would have called cockroaches. <laughs> the more I try to put them down, the more they multiply. You see, one of the things Paul was trying to teach them in, in these, these references that I'm giving is there was a concept, and I want you to see this in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 27. How many know there's something in the Word of God called the Aaronic Blessing? And guys, it's more than just speaking the Aaronic Blessing over a people. That was part of the equation. But how many know that in every Catholic church tomorrow, in every Episcopal church, in, in every, uh, the old line churches, how many know the Aaronic Blessing gets spoken every service over all of them? But do you really think they walk in it? Well, I know the reason why, Brother Mike, it's not said in Hebrew. <laughs> Hold up, more than that. Verse 6 and 27, And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. How many would like to get there? But you've got to look back at the duty of the Levites. The duty of the Levites was to make sure that the word of God abided in the hearts of the people. It was their job to teach them the word because if the word began to dwell in the people and the people began to walk according to the word, the blessing would stick. That's going to hit in a minute. That if a people were dwelling in the word and the commandments of God, they begin to be set free. And if they were set free, then what the priests were doing was echoing what heaven was already doing. And they begin to place the name of God on the people because they were a humble and an obedient people. Guys, it's the same today, except how many know that we're, we're not according to the Levitical priesthood today. We're according to the order of Melchizedek. And in the order of Melchizedek, it is Jesus who commands the blessing. That if Jesus finds a person or a people that have humbled themselves and dwell in his word and become obedient, Jesus stands as the high priest and he puts the name of Yeshua upon those people and he begins to command that blessing. And when that blessing is commanded, hell cannot curse what God has blessed. But how many today in what we see in Christianity could Jesus 
place his name. You know, with the, the name biblical life, I am very, because I've had people, can, 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 can we use biblical life? Can we use biblical life? Do we want to use? No, 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 no. Because I don't know what stupid thing you're going to do, and I don't want you to do it with biblical's life name on it, because if you do it, it will reflect back to me. Therefore, I'm not going to let you use that name. The only mistake that I did, as far as the world's concerned, is back when God gave us that name years and years ago, I should have trademarked that sucker. Because there's a few out there that are using them saying, oh, God, just don't let them be weird. <laughs> don't let them be weird, Jesus, because everybody's going to point back to Michael A because I've been using it for so long. If I'm that way, how much more is Jesus that way? Don't do something stupid and say, the Lord led me to do it. How I many know the Lord don't lead people into stupidity? The Lord leads people into wisdom. Let it dwell in you with wisdom. Guys, when Jesus places his name upon us, he is testifying before heaven and hell that we bear his character and his power in the earth. There's, there's a, there's a, there is a remnant right now that are changing everything in their lives to come in line with the word of God. And Jesus is getting ready to place his name on those people. Hell is going to take notice of it. Heaven is going to take notice of it. And the earth is going to begin realizing it. I'm going to prophesy this. There, there, are, there are agents within what we call the left that are all about sin coming against the Word of God. They're used to trampling the church. And what they're not realizing is there's going to be an individual or individuals that have the name of Jesus placed on them. If they touch it, disaster is going to fall on their heads. They have never seen that before. They, the, the heathen have been emboldened because they've never seen any consequences. That is getting ready to change as Jesus finds a people that he can place his name on. I don't care what the name is over the door of the church. Come and know God doesn't pay any attention to that. He doesn't care what a, a denomination name is. He looks at the person's heart and how they're walking with him. And the remnant is going to begin raising up in the name. And we're going to see the blessing of Abraham come upon them, that he is going to bless those who bless him, and he is going to curse those who curse him. I got an email this week from Richard Booker. I love that, brother. He is one of the most meekest men you'll ever see, but I, he gets fired up. He is bold as a lion. They're at, the, at the Olympics, they re, one of the, the Olympic... Uh, committee members refused to allow a few moments of silence for the for the Jewish people that were killed in Munich years and years ago. And then when you find, you look at the guy, he has a Palestinian flag around him. And so did Brother Booker, did, did uh, he say, well, oh, Lord, just bless him. <laughs> he rose up as the remnant's going to raise up, and he said, you know what? May God curse him with the curses of those who come against Israel, God's people. Because God said, I'll bless them to bless you and curse them that curse you. And I thought, man, that's a strong statement. And the Holy Spirit said, I inspired him to write it. Because things are changing in the spirit. There is, there, there is, there is a, it, it's not all this gray stuff anymore. It's going to be black or it's going to be white. It's going to be blessed or it's going to be cursed. It's going to have his name on it or it's going to have some other name that heaven is not going to recognize. That's where we're headed. And guys, there is a responsibility for bearing that name. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. This is part of God's big ten. Guys, I want you to be able to function in this unction. I want you to be able to move in the power of the name. How many know that, that strong, the name of the Lord is like a strong tower? And if you become that name, you become the tower the enemy cannot overcome. You become that standard that the Lord raises up. 
You know, so many times you read the word is, when the enemy comes in like a, like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard against him. How many know that comma is not there in the Hebrew? And it can be read, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord raises up a standard about How many like to be the flood? I want to be the flood. Got to walk in the name. Got to walk worthy of the name. Got to learn how to function in that name. And see, in the, in the Old Testament, how many know that the children of Israel bore the name of Yahweh in the earth? They were the only ones representing him. Everybody else was pagan, was pagan to the core. That was either being ruled by the philosophies that came out of Egypt or came out of Babylon. And you can go back into every, every other religion in the earth, and they pull from one of those two veins. And so since they were the only ones that carried his name in the earth, this is the commandment of God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Ouch. Well, that means I'm not supposed to use the name of Jesus as a swear word. Oh, kind of, yeah. I mean, that's kind of important. But that, that's the minutia over here. That word vain is shav in the Hebrew, which means you make it empty, you make it vain, you make it a falsehood, you make it into nothingness. You make it into lying and worthlessness because of conduct. That's what that Hebrew word means. If I have the name of Jesus placed on me, I have the responsibility to make God glorified in the earth, and by my word and by my deed, I need to do it all in the name of Jesus so that he can be glorified because God can only be glorified in your words and in your deeds. And if I don't function as Jesus functions, then I, if I tell people that I'm bearing his name and I'm walking in the flesh, I have made his name empty. There are a lot of Christian denominations and a lot of Christian groups by the crazy stuff they're doing. They are, me they are rendering the name of Jesus as nothing in the earth. And therefore, it's nothing, against, you know, it's nothing coming against the body of Christ. It's nothing using the name of Jesus as a curse word. You know, when I was in the military, it's really interesting that uh, you can be around, uh, I've been around Russians, I've been around Germans, I've been around Koreans, I've been around Swedes, and what's interesting to me that the name of Jesus pronounced in English is a curse word in all those languages. I mean, it, it, it was shocking to me. I, uh, I was... I was up in, in the housing, and there's this one Korean lady, boy, I mean, she was going on in Korean 500 miles an hour, and all of a sudden you hear Jesus. And I, and I turned to a sergeant that I knew, and I'm thinking, well, you know, you know Korean, your wife's Korean, and he just kind of hung his head. He said, he just, she just used Jesus as a curse word. And I said, well, why didn't she do it in Korean? He said, it, it's always done in English. Why? Because of America, that name has been taken forth, and America has made that name empty and void. And God is saying, I will not hold you guiltless. But there's a people. There is a people who are called by his name that are going to humble themselves and pray and submit to the will of God and begin functioning in a way that's going to make that name holy once again. And my desire is that everyone associated with biblical life would become an individual just like that. Why don't you become the remnant? Why don't you become the 1% that walk with God right? There has to be. It has to start somewhere. It has to start with someone. Why not you? Why not me? And why not here? Because I want the will, I want God's good pleasure to flow in my life, and I want to move in the faith of his power. Oh, we've got a guys. God is calling us the secret 
to power and to answered prayer is when you live your life in and by the name of Jesus, when you humble yourself, i.e. crucify the flesh, and submit to the word and the will of God by abiding in the word, your words and your deeds begin to take on a new power. And it doesn't always have to sound powerful. How many know that we have a little lady in this congregation that loves to write children's books? And how many know that in those simple words can come power? It's not getting puffed up, you know. We, we got a rooster. Now, he's still a chick, but, I mean, he tries out there. He tries hard. I mean, he, he tries. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it's like, I need to go out there and lay hands on that rooster and pray for him. Lord, give him a little bit of strength. I mean, he, he doesn't even, sometimes he just sits down and goes, Rrr. Why? He's not grown up. But you can, you can sense one day there's destiny in him that one day he's just going to let her rip, you know. Let all the roosters and the chickens in the neighborhood know I'm here. Let me tell you something. There, there's something wanting to be released in you that heaven's been waiting for, that hell's been afraid of. Let me tell you something. There, one of the reasons why God loosed such a healing of a wounded spirit this morning is the devil knew that there was a power that was going to be released in you, and so he wounded you so that you could move forth in that, and the presence of God was here this morning to begin healing you and restoring you because you're going to be that person that as you abide in his word, you're set free of the past. You're set free of the mistakes. You're set free of what others did. Many Many times when they misrepresented Jesus. Did you know there are more people hurt in church than there are in bars? It's just scars that don't show. God wants to heal that. And then to begin using you to heal and restore other people. I, I am very... I'm trying to find the right word. <laughs> I am very zealous over watching what comes in and what's done here because I want to make sure nobody gets hurt. This is supposed to be a safe place. Because of that, there are some things I won't allow here. Why well, does Mike like? He's just quenching the spirit. He's just, he's just cramping my style. He's just... I'm not going to let wolves frolic, frolic, or whatever you want to call it, frolic, there you go, frolic in God's pasture. I want to be like David. There's a rock or a staff coming if you hang in this pasture very long because this is going to be a place of healing. And we have to have the same thing with our homes. You see, I figure that if I show you the example here, you're going to do it at home. Your home has to be the safest place on earth. For our children, Home's got to be a place where you're loved. You may get corrected, but you know that you're corrected because you're loved. And that there's words of healing and words of acceptance and words of instruction. But guys, let me ask you something. If home isn't safe and church isn't safe, where can people go to be safe? Behind a gun? In a gang? With a crowd? I have found an interesting thing about crowds. They tend to go over cliffs. <coughs> Many Christians think they're going in a safe place. They don't realize they're in a stampede about ready to go off a cliff. And a lot of the movements that we have today, they're about on the precipice of a cliff. And people think because there's thousands of them with them, there have been many a cow realize free falling wasn't a part of the trip because they went off a cliff because they without thought that's the thing about a stampede it's without thought you just go whatever direction everybody else is going Jesus shows us the opposite I'm going to end with this because this is what I want you to be like everybody that was religious was going to Jerusalem for one of the feasts and they were all going to, and I mean that isn't a bad thing but the Bible says all of a sudden Jesus just kind of peeled himself off. Everybody's going this way. He goes this way because he had an appointment with the man at the pool of Bethesda. 
He was a man who didn't do it by rote. He didn't do it because everybody else was doing it. And he did it exactly the way the Father said it. Go, and I don't care if there's 10,000 by the pool. You're not going to set up a tabernacle. You're not going to set up a church. You're not going to set up a healing ministry. I got, you, I got for you an appointment with one man. You go in, heal that man, and you walk off. That would be hard. If I, if, I, if I had been the Son of God, and I knew that I had healing power in my hands, and I could have cleared that pool, wouldn't the flesh wanted to do that? Even the good flesh, wouldn't the flesh wanted to do that? And yet that had to be crucified in the heart of Christ, because the Holy Spirit said, this one. What about all the rest? That's between them and God. We don't know where they were. We, uh, we know where they were physically, but we don't know where they were spiritually. We don't know what was going on in their lives. But God said, this one I'm going to do for my glory. I, I've got a purpose for this. And see, when a man or woman will quit walking with the crowd and walk with the Holy Spirit, you'll walk off and leave them going off and doing their thing. But God has a divine appointment for you. And the only way to do it is you've got to humble yourself and be obedient. When you do that, the power of of the name flows. Now let's go back to the first scripture that I mentioned. I'm gonna, I am going to end with this. Let's see if I even put it in my notes. I did. John chapter 16. Mike's getting ready to wind this thing up. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is a day of miracles. This is a day of miracles. Because I don't know how far away I am from 60 minutes. Eight minutes and 16 seconds. See, it's a day of miracles. Okay. John 16, 23 and 24. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto you have, nothing, have asked nothing in my name. Uh, have asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, how many now understand asking in the name better? If I have his name upon me and I'm representing him, I've got to ask in the character and the nature of Jesus. Therefore, you may ask God for an avail instead of a Porsche. You may ask God for a second-hand car that's reliable instead of believing God for that new SUV, then you've got to believe God every day for the gas to put in it. People have used this as a magic formula. If I tag this on the end of a, of a, of a prayer, God's got to give it to me. And Jesus said, you want, the, you want to know the secret of answered prayer? Ask in my character. Stand in my name. Stand in who I am and what I did. And when you go before heaven, you thank it through and you ask in the way that I would have asked. If you ask in my name, if you ask in my character, if you ask in my nature, I guarantee you, you're going to get it. How many know Jesus got answered every prayer he ever prayed? James said it another way. He said that uh, you ask, but you ask amiss because it's consumed in the flesh. Don't let any man think he's going to get that kind of prayer answered. Heaven is not going to answer your flesh. Heaven is going to answer what lines up with Jesus. And if you will allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, you can get every answer to your prayers. 2 Corinthians says, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Messiah. But it's got to line up with Messiah. The more you line up with Jesus, the more Jesus can flow through you. That's why it's all got to come under the blood. We've got to have repentance and under the blood. And then even after I, I go through repentance and under the blood, I humble myself before Almighty God. I start abiding in His Word and I start being obedient to the commands and statutes of God. And as I submit myself to that and learn to be more like Jesus, God starts cranking up the power. God starts cranking up the blessing. God starts cranking up the authority. You see, there's a place you're going to get where you don't have to pray for 40 minutes to get the devil to back off. Someone really consumed by the name of Jesus will look up and say, that's about enough of that. 
I've told you many times before when I was, and, and you know, when you're in the military, the, the, local, the, the local bowling alley is also the local bar, is the local pinball, you know, it's all kind of grouped together. And uh, being at the 3rd the, uh, Infantry Division headquarters, we had special forces and deltas also coming through. How many of them are a whole different breed of boy? And every once in a while, especially on Friday night, you'd get guys drinking too much and there'd be something called a brawl. No one's ever heard of brawl in the military. And so we, we have this sergeant major who's a delta. That means this is a lethal, we a lethal weapon, okay? And you have guys fighting and screaming, and one of them bumped his beer. And he said, that's enough. And you could have heard a pin drop in that place. Because he said it in authority. He knew who he was. He knew how to function in what he was. And although that's in the flesh and in the military, but how many know that when you know who you are and you function in who you are and everything that you are falls in line with the character of Jesus, you don't have to do a six-hour prayer to back the devil off. You look up and you recognize it and say, that is about enough. I bind this up in the name of Jesus. And that puts it to rest right there. If you'll function that way and respect the name of Jesus that way, hell will respect the name of Jesus in you that way. That's what I want. That's my heart's desire for every one of you. That when you speak, it's like E.F. Hutton in the, in, on Wall Street. Heaven stops and hell stops to hear what you're getting ready to say, to see what is bound and what is loosed, what moves forward and what stops because an agent of Jesus of Nazareth said, that will be enough. That's how you still a storm. Well, that's how you release a blessing. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask that you would give us the grace the supernatural ability of God to move in the things of God. Father, that you would allow us to be that remnant that hear your voice. And Father, we will be humble before you and we're going to be obedient. And Father, what keeps on coming up in my spirit is those that are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land. And Father, I just release that over the people today, that as we stand in the name of Jesus, and as we're willing and obedient, we're going to begin eating the good of God's good pleasure for us. Maybe the first time in our lives, Father, but we're going to see it in the land of the living. We're going to see it in our lives, even when things around us may be falling apart. Father, because of Jesus, things in us and around us in our lives are going to begin coming together. And Father, I thank you. And I praise you for it, in Jesus' name.